Okay, um, so we will uh, do it in pretty much the same, is this one? Yeah. Uh, in the same kind of order uh, today, I'm going to uh, start by presenting um, and then um, uh, I'll, I'll then I'll, uh, sh uh, uh, Roberto will, will, will take over and then there'll be plenty of time for uh, class discussion as well. Um, and just as a reminder, next week we're beginning our series of sort of um, external uh, interlocutors uh, who will be visiting. And uh, the idea is not to have them make presentations, but to have actually a conversation. Um, so uh, come ready to, uh, to ask questions. Um, so I, I want to start with the, um, with the, yes. I think a little louder perhaps. Uh, louder. Let me see if I can fix this or, I'm not sure there is a volume here, but let me, let me uh, try to speak louder and if my voice uh, trails off, let me know. Um, okay, uh, so last time I told you that I wanted to get back at the relationship, um, at this, um, uh, the, the topic of the relationship between um, uh, ongoing political developments and, and populism uh, and globalization. And so um, uh, the, the, the first half of my comments will be directed um, at that uh, set of issues. Um, I had shown you a version of this chart last week, which is, shows you the ups and downs of globalization, highlighting the fact that um, uh, this is not the first era of globalization. Um, and it's interesting that um, the first era of globalization was very much subject uh, to the same kind of political uh, backlash as well, uh, suggesting that perhaps there is something uh, um, uh, uh, in advanced stages of globalization that um, results in, 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 a, in a kind of a political uh, uh, mobilization uh, against it. Um, and uh, in particular in the United States, uh, which is really the birthplace of, of populism uh, in its political form, um, there was a very clear relationship between the uh, agenda of um, the People's Party, which is this um, uh, um, uh, a, a political movement in the late 19th century uh, in the United States um, that was driven, uh, uh, that was animated by the uh, complaints of uh, various groups, in particular uh, farmers uh, in the southern and western uh, states of the United States, uh, which um, were feeling the a burden of many of the consequences of the globalization of that era. Um, the globalization of that era, of course, was characterized by the gold standard. Uh, and under the gold standard, effectively, uh, countries had their monetary, pol monetary policy on autopilot. Uh, mo the monetary policy consisted of maintaining a, um, a fixed exchange rate uh, in terms of the, the price of gold. And that meant that you had absolutely no ability to control your domestic price level because it was essentially uh, fixed uh, in terms of uh, the requirements of the gold standard. Um, and during periods when uh, gold was scarce, uh, it would re essentially resulting in what today we would call contractionary monetary policy. There would be long periods of price deflation. And what for farmers, what that meant was that the prices of the goods the farm goods that they were producing uh, were actually falling. Um, and uh, these farmers that had contracted debt uh, at fixed nominal interest rates uh, were therefore facing very high real interest rates um, uh, on, on account of falling prices um, and given a fixed nominal interest rate at which they had contracted debt. Um, and, and, and farmers and the, the farmers' alliances, uh, which uh, was the political reflection of that disaffectation, uh, essentially um, uh, found uh, the culprit uh, in uh, the gold standard, because gold standard prevented uh, the country to enlarge the money supply um, and uh, stop deflation. Uh, 
uh, in the conditions of late 19th century, uh, what uh, expanding the money supply would have meant was actually uh, would be to monetize silver. Uh, so in fact, um, you know, the second big plank uh, of the populist movement in late 19th century United States were, aside from the farmers, were the silver miners. Um, and because they, uh, by, by monetizing silver, uh, there would be a demand created for uh, the output of silver mines. Um, and, um, but the political expression of the populism, and, and it's, it's captured very well in this uh, a very well-known uh, uh, speech that William Jennings Bryan um, gave in 1996, at the, uh, at 1896, uh, in the Democratic National Convention, uh, which ends with this uh, you know, emphatic statement that says, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. In other words, you cannot let uh, the gold standard, this sort of globalization dictate uh, what's going to happen to the fates of, of, so, of so many small farmers. Um, and this was sort of a, a very kind of, of uh, emblematic uh, expression uh, of, um, of this, this first uh, uh, expression of, of populism that, that farmed the, the, the uh, that targeted uh, the gold standard and of course the upholders of the gold standard, which were the financiers and the bankers in, in, in New York and in New England. Uh, that was, if you will, the original backlash uh, against uh, globalization. Um, so uh, I want to come back uh, to this tension uh, between uh, globalization and, and domestic uh, uh, politics and try to um, uh, draw this out uh, in, a, in a kind of a general way. Um, uh, use, you know, even though I think the, the US populist experience of the late 19th century is a good concrete expression of that. Uh, I think, as we see today, uh, it has much wider, much wider relevance. Um, but let me just um, uh, outline what are going to be some of the key ideas uh, in my presentation uh, today. Um, I want to sort of um, put them out uh, right at front. Some of them I'll be talking about more than others, uh, but even those that I don't talk about much will be coming back to later. One, uh, an idea that uh, at some level is very uncontroversial, uh, but I think its practical uh, importance is often uh, neglected. Uh, this, this notion that markets uh, you know, don't, aren't self-generating and self-functioning. They always need to be embedded in a whole range of non-market institutions. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and these sort of non-market institutions cover a very wide range of, of, of arrangements. Uh, everything from uh, legal regimes, such as property rights and, 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 and a contract regime, uh, to various regulatory arrangements, uh, <coughs> such as competition policy or antitrust behavior to prevent monopolization of markets, uh, financial regulations uh, to ensure that um, uh, you know, asymmetric information and various systemic risks are, are taken into account, uh, consumer safety and health regulations to ensure that that uh, corporations uh, don't take advantage of, of, of consumers, environmental regulations to internalize uh, environmental externalities, um, various tax systems to fund the public goods uh, that require, that the governments require uh, uh, to fund their, their infrastructure and education investments, because without those, markets uh, can, can function. Labor market institutions to regulate uh, the relationships between labor and employers, workers and, and capital. Uh, of course, sort of a, a broader range uh, of, of regulations, which you might call industrial policies or productive development policies, which we'll be dealing with extensively in this course when we talk about how can the benefits uh, of uh, um, advanced technologies be disseminated uh, throughout the rest of society. Those really have to do fundamentally with these productive development policies or, or, or industrial policies. So I'm just checking these off. Um, set, um, a, a, a third point uh, is that uh, there are, um, you know, it, it's, it's much easier to state what the purpose of uh, um, useful institutional arrangements are than to specify the forms that they take or what uh, actual policy or, or legal form uh, that, they will, uh, that they will take. 
Uh, it's very, each one of these uh, kinds of functions can be performed in a number of different ways. Um, and, um, and, and the fact, the fact that these different uh, functions of regulating or administering or, or creating markets have different uh, uh, implications for um, who gets what and um, how close we are to the productive frontier also means that there is a significant role for broad economic principles and economic analysis um, uh, to help us determine what those precise consequences are, both for productive efficiency as well as for the distributional consequences and any trade-offs uh, that, that might arise. So one of, the, one of the ongoing sources of debate between uh, Professor Unger and myself is to what extent there are in fact useful economic principles that one can apply here um, and with me sort of making the argument that it's very hard to think through seriously about what kind of institutional repackaging or experimentation is likely to perform well, what kind is not likely to perform well without the use of these economic principles. Whereas I think you will hear Professor Runger argue that the kind of economic principles that you need to apply here are either do not exist or are ultimately trivial. Um, so that they're not particularly useful. This is going to be a source of uh, a debate, I think, uh, judging from previous years as we go on. Um, how are these um, sort of, we can think of these institutions in a normative fashion, we can also think of them in a positive fashion, how do they actually come about? Um, and um, uh, uh, I think here, obviously, uh, much more than simply uh, the direct economics of these institutions is, is, uh, is, is, um, uh, uh, is what matters. Uh, historical trajectories, um, social preferences, ideas, our institutional imagination, all of them will play a role uh, as well as uh, these economic principles. Okay, and finally the point about uh, that I want to get into is my entry point uh, into the globalization dilemma, uh, that there is uh, a, an inherent tension uh, between um, the, the scope of markets, um, how broad they are, and how much they can spread. Therefore, um, what the scale uh, of the division of labor is, um, and institutional experimentation. That institution, institutional, experimentation, institutional experimentation relies on the notion uh, that uh, you can have a uh, certain amount of institutional diversity, uh, that different jurisdictions, different localities have somewhat different types of institutional arrangements. Um, that, however, that idea of institutional diversity is in tension uh, with, uh, the, uh, in, with market integration. Um, that, and, and the reason there is a, uh, there's a tension uh, um, is probably best understood through the notion of, of arbitrage, that Market integration brings arbitrage. Arbitrage uh, is what uh, undercuts the possibilities of institutional diversity. I'll come back to this, with this, to this point. It's, I suspect it's another point where we will disagree uh, with, with Professor Ongo. Okay, so the, the political trilemma uh, of the global economy uh, is, is this. It just says that essentially of these three things, a hyperglobalization, which I'll define in a second, uh, national sovereignty um, and, and mass politics, or think about it as participatory democracies, of those two, three things, uh, you cannot have all three at once. Uh, that you can have at most two out of those three things. And depending which of those two, three, de depending on which of those two uh, you take, you're going to have a somewhat different type of a global economy with somewhat different kinds of, of, of implications, okay? So uh, I'll explain this, but first let me make sure uh, that I define or explain what I mean by hyperglobalization, because I mean by that in some sense a kind of a, not exactly the type of globalization that we have today, but sort of a, a limit idea of a globalization. Uh, it refers to a, um, a textbook <coughs> model of full market integration, of full economic integration. Uh, that is, uh, I'm talking about a global economy or a world economy where essentially national borders do not matter. There is no difference between a national market and a global market. Uh, so these jurisdictional discontinuities 
impose no transaction costs. Uh, that's the sense in which it's a limit, complete market integration. So what does that mean for these jurisdictions, in particular the nation state? Uh, so the nation state must not impose any kind of transaction cost, even though it exists. Uh, how is that possible? It's only possible if, first of all, the nation state does not impose any explicit restrictions on the flow of goods, capital, or services. Okay, so there are no restrictions on trade. There are no restrictions on capital mobility. So no restrictions at the border. Uh, beyond that, and secondly, uh, the nation state must harmonize its legal, monetary, and uh, regulatory regimes so as to minimize those transactions costs that would otherwise uh, impede uh, cross-border uh, flow of goods and services. If I have different restrictions on, in, if I have different regulations on capital, if I have different regulations on how products are to be manufactured, then my trade partners, uh, it imposes a transaction cost on investors and traders across the border, so therefore I must harmonize these away. That's what, it, what a lot of what the World Trade Organization does do. Um, and third, perhaps in some sense, the most uh, demanding of that is that not only do I bring my regulations in line with my trade partners so that these don't act as transaction costs, I must also commit to not um, uh, deviating uh, because even if I have, I might have a fixed exchange rate today, but if there is a risk that I'm going to depreciate tomorrow, that impels a future risk of transaction, and that itself is going to be a, a kind of a, a transaction cost. And therefore, I must commit uh, to not deviating from these harmonized regimes. And there you see, for example, why the European Union, or a set of four nation states, went through stages from a kind of a snake on the exchange rate where you limited uh, the uh, flexibility of exchange rates across countries to a fixed exchange rate to ultimately a single money because single money was precisely the one where you removed away all the, any possibility, any and all possibilities of uh, changing your currency rate. And that meant that was, uh, that was the way to get to a single uh, market. Uh, in, in, in finance and trade by, uh, by, uh, by irrevocably uh, removing the possibility of a um, currency depreciation. And the euro, of course, doesn't actually have any way you can get out of it. Uh, once you're in, you can't get out, and that's the whole thing. That's the whole idea uh, that, you know, that, you're not, that you provide a kind of a, a permanent uh, commitment uh, not to impose uh, any transactions costs that might arise from you having your own independent monetary policy and your own independent exchange rate. Okay. Um, so uh, why is uh, an economic union uh, incompatible with diversity uh, within the union? Uh, here, the key idea is, is the logic of arbitrage. Logic of arbitrage is simply the logic of uh, buying cheap and selling beer. And the problem with different institutional, um, uh, from, you know, difference, differences in institutions is that they create different cost structures. And therefore, any kind of trade or capital flow that's driven by these differences uh, in institutional structure uh, inherently um, have a way of undermining these differences or creating uh, concerns about, uh, you know, unlevel playing fields or fair trade. Okay? Uh, so unless uh, you block uh, these uh, arbitrage flows, they're going to necessarily undermine differences uh, in, in uh, jurisdictional regulations and different social models. So some of the very you know, straightforward examples are, for example, taxation of capital or taxation of wealth, right? So if corporations are mobile, uh, they're going to go where the corporate tax is low uh, if professionals, wealthy individuals, are similarly mobile, uh, they'll put their money uh, in the low-tax jurisdictions. So you can try to maintain a high-tax jurisdiction that's necessarily going to be undermined by the low-tax jurisdiction. Similar kinds of arguments apply to domains such as labor standards. Uh, you may want to maintain high labor standards, but if your corporations are competing with, uh, uh, with jurisdictions, 
uh, that have much lower labor standards. They can outsource. Uh, they can uh, employ uh, uh, providers in, in, in low labor standard jurisdictions. Product standards, uh, financial regulations, uh, other regulations, their logic uh, is, is all the same. This is the kind of, this is a set of issues uh, which the European Union grapples with on a daily, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, because on the one hand, it's a single market. So it kind of a, it's, a, it's an area which has taken the idea of hyper-globalization the furthest it could possibly go by having a single market where, in principle, you don't have any obstacles, any, any transactions costs, the movements of services, capital, goods, people. But in order to ensure that, uh, in an environment uh, where, in fact, some of the uh, social policies, some of the labor markets, and many of the tax regimes are, in fact, different uh, across uh, the existing uh, member states, they constantly have to come up with solutions uh, to these problems uh, that, um, uh, that, that arise. And sometimes uh, they enforce the single market, um, and sometimes they enable uh, the existence of differences uh, in different nation states uh, by uh, accepting the deviation from the single market. Most, one of the most recent examples of that is the directive or the revision of the directive with respect to, to uh, posted workers. And there the issue was, uh, is Polish workers who come to work temporarily in France to make it concrete, temporarily coming into France, should they be working under Polish labor standards or should they be working under French labor standards? Under a free, complete mobility standard or single union, any temporary movement essentially is subject to home country regulations because you're producing a service based from the home country and exporting it. Um, but that would, mean, that would mean that French unions and French workers would be directly competing uh, with Polish workers in their own national market uh, um, subject to labor standards that are much lower uh, and from the perspective of French workers much worse than those that exist um, in, uh, in, in France. Ultimately, because that was uh, politically so controversial, in that case, the European Commission actually decided that, in fact, uh, they would take a step back from economic union uh, by requiring that these postal workers, um, the temporary workers, be subject to French labor regulations rather than Polish labor market regulations. Um, so in trade, the equivalent of that would have been uh, to ask <coughs> companies that are outsourcing to countries, let's say in the developing world, uh, to be producing under developed country standards rather than developing country standards. Okay. So you can maintain, this is a, uh, these tensions can be maintained uh, when economic uh, regulation or re economic integration uh, is, is limited um, and therefore uh, the, the system of, of uh, these different jurisdictions coming into conflict with each other, that, that tension is relatively low. I think that's sort of what was the case under an earlier version of globalization under the GATT regime, which was a much less ambitious model of global economic integration. Okay, so one way of uh, understanding this, the, the, the point of problem is, is through a, a, sim, a, a very um, uh, quick historical tour uh, because essentially the world economy has seen at least sort of two out of the three possibilities. Uh, and the European Union, Union provides the glimmer of a third possibility. Um, so the, the original globalization, uh, um, and I was talking about the, Europe, the US populist movement and the classical gold standard era, uh, that era was essentially a system where um, you maintain hyper-globalization essentially partly in the area of finance and money and capital, um, in a system where uh, the world economy was jurisdictionally divided. Um, uh, and as we saw in the context of the uh, US case with the, with the gold standard, uh, essentially that provided, that kept uh, constituent units on a kind of a uh, straight track that they couldn't deviate from the kind of monetary policy uh, that the gold standard required. That became a problem in the 1890s. It became a huge problem in the interwar period, which was when ultimately the gold standard uh, uh, collapsed. So the gold standard <coughs> model was one where 
you significantly narrowed the scope of domestic economic policy making um, in order to minimize the flows to international uh, capital and goods. In other words, if you wanted to maintain the gold standard, essentially the national uh, uh, policy authorities had to say, I'm not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize that. That means maintaining the gold standard, no matter what's happening to my farmers, no matter how high the domestic unemployment rate goes, goes up. So um, what today we would call in the European context sort of austerity politics, was periodically, austerity policies was periodically the result of the gold standard. Uh, but that was okay um, as long as um, uh, these countries uh, had ways of keeping uh, the backlash uh, at bay. Um, and one way of, of, of doing that, of course, is by having uh, a kind of politics uh, which, is, um, which keeps, in some sense, democracy at bay. Now, the late 19th century, the US example is interesting, and it's, 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 we, know, we don't actually know what would have happened uh, had the scarcity of gold continued. Because 1896, when uh, William Jennings Bryan made that, uh, that fateful speech, also happens the year when sort of that's gold scarcity and therefore the uh, austerity policies in the United States hit, hit its essentially the, 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 the most extreme point. Uh, in the 1890s, uh, 1890, subsequently there were gold discoveries, and therefore there was a lot of supply of gold. Uh, prices began to rise, and then sort of this, this austerity period uh, uh, was over. But ultimately, um, and the greatest example of this was Great Britain in 1931. Great Britain went back to the gold standard after the First World War in 1925. Uh, ultimately, uh, faced a kind of situation. Uh, by the late 1920s and 1930, 1931, which is very analogous to the uh, US case, where uh, unemployment was rising, uh, workers wanted uh, you know, sort of um, a, a monetary expansion um, and reflation, uh, but under, the, of course, the rules of the gold standard, Britain had to keep very high in real interest rates, uh, so gold standard was aggravating significantly the economic depression in which Britain found itself. Um, Ultimately, uh, Britain had to uh, get off the gold standard in order to reflate the economy. Two years later, FDR would do the same in the United States uh, to allow, once again, prices to rise and to help the uh, employment, uh, employment uh, recover. Um, the, the, the second model of um, uh, globalization that we experience for a few decades after the Second World War, uh, uh, we might call the, the Bretton Woods Compromise, uh, where uh, essentially uh, we combined uh, national sovereignty uh, with democratic politics and purposefully kept hyper-globalization at bay. I say purposefully uh, because this was very much uh, in the conception of um, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who was one of the architects of the immediate post-war uh, international monetary system. And that Keynes' ideas derived uh, precisely from his experience in the interwar period and the Britain, Britain's, uh, the collapse of the gold standard uh, in Britain and in the other countries. Because the lesson uh, that Keynes drew from that experience was precisely that in a modern society uh, with labor unions, uh, with uh, mass franchise, with mass media, where public opinion uh, would play a big role in the determination of economic policy, that it was no longer possible for economic policy or government policies to be driven simply by the needs of the global economy or by the needs uh, of a, um, uh, a, a, a kind of a high level or, or advanced level of globalization. So, for Keynes, it was absolutely uh, critical to um, carve up domestic policy autonomy, open up, spa open up space uh, for the government to pursue, uh, in particular, counter-cyclical monetary and fiscal policies, what today we call Keynesian <coughs> policy. Uh, but the idea expanded also to other areas uh, of regulatory policy, industrial policy, tax policies, and so forth. So this was a a kind of a, a, a model um, of um, globalization which was very limited in its ambitions. 
simply removing uh, the most egregious forms of trade protection uh, at the border, uh, um, stimulating long-term foreign investment, but keeping away from short-term capital movements, in particular, capital controls were to be part of the regime. As, as Keynes said, capital controls need to be, need to be part of this uh, international economic system, not as a temporary expedient, but as a permanent feature. Uh, because without capital controls, government policies would be overwhelmed by the demands of global short-term capital flows. Okay. This was uh, an explicitly incomplete uh, globalization. Um, so logically, of course, we have a third possibility, um, and that would be sort of doing away with the nation state. You could imagine a kind of a, uh, a global version uh, of a United States where nation states come together, uh, agree to harmonize their policies to a large extent, agree to cede sovereignty in a very wide uh, area of economic policy to a, 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 a global government. In principle, that global government could be uh, a democracy of some sort. Now, uh, this, of course, seems like a, a very um, uh, you know, um, a pie in the sky kind of an idea for the world as a whole. Uh, but it, in many ways, of course, uh, a version of this uh, is still a possibility uh, in the European Union because what the European Union and the Eurozone in particular has tried to do uh, is achieve a version of this hyper-globalized economy within Europe. Uh, but what the European Union has never really quite done, quite done is really decide uh, which one of these three it wants to give up. Uh, and that, to some extent, is, is really the ongoing uh, structural problem uh, of the, uh, of the uh, European Union. And I think you know, part of this sort of part of you know, the reasoning behind Brexit, part of the, the, the periodic uh, crises in the Eurozone and, and the possibility uh, that some countries might have to leave the Eurozone, uh, Greece some years back, uh, periodically the possibility of Italy leaving comes up. Uh, all of that is a reflection of the fact that European political elites and European populations uh, haven't really decided which exactly, which two of these uh, possibilities, which of these corners they actually want uh, uh, to have or which corner they, they want to, to, to give up. Okay? All right. Um, so, so that's the, uh, the, the globalization trilemma, which I've presented as a series of, of trade-offs and decisions that, that need to be made. I know that Professor Ungar is going to um, uh, say more about that and, and, and criticize some aspects of this, so we'll discuss that uh, further on. I've talked a lot about institutions. I just want to say a few more words about institutions before turning over to, um, to, uh, uh, to Roberto. First, you know, just to make sure that I don't think I actually define what institutions are. There's just a couple of possible uh, definitions. Probably the the, um, the the easiest to remember and the one that uh, you know most appropriate is this definition that goes back to the historian Douglas North, which he described institutions as the rules of the game in a society. And that's really all, all there is to it. And of course, if you define it that way, it's also clear that what we mean by institutions aren't just necessarily the formal rules and regulations. Um, it's also the informal rules, uh, the norms, the patterns of conduct, conventions, moral codes, ingrained patterns of behavior uh, that uh, are in society. And that's sort of, you know, those are very much part of the uh, institutional uh, landscape. Uh, uh, as well. Okay. Now, um, why do markets need institutions? Uh, I think this is the part of the story that is extremely important um, and uh, the, the typical uh, exposition of supply and demand um, and market economies leaves out. Uh, in typical market with supply and demand, we're talking about supply side, a bunch of firms, we can talk about demand side, a bunch of consumers, and firms uh, essentially supply uh, consumers uh, with uh, goods that consumers want to buy. Now, of course, behind this relationship and what enables this relationship to be productive is a very 
um, intricate set of relationships about inputs, outputs, and, and complementary services. Firms, of course, rely on infrastructure. They rely on trained workers. They rely on reliable provision of intermediate inputs. They rely uh, on capital markets and credit. Um, and then uh, they, uh, the government comes in, and they have to pay taxes. So they rely on um, a kind of a, um, a, a, a a judici judicious administration of, uh, um, of, of tax policies. Um, and of course, you know, they need to be protected uh, from thefts and violence and expropriation. Um, so they need to be, their, their, their rights have to be protected from, from those. And in turn, behind all of those are a series of arrangements uh, that are examples of the institutional arrangements of society. And the quality of these productive relationships is always going to be, uh, at least in part, a function of the quality of all these other arrangements of society, these institutional arrangements, um, mechanisms of contract enforcement between the suppliers uh, and the firm, okay? uh, mechanisms of uh, education and skilling up and training up the labor force that provides the skilled labor that the firm needs, the public investment regime that provides infrastructure on which the firm relies. The various banking and securities laws and bankruptcy procedures without which capital markets and credit market relationships could not work. A system of tax administration and government administration without which a good tax regime doesn't work. Uh, political stability and property rights protection and a police force uh, that ensures that the firm is protected from thefts, theft and violence and expropriation. Of course, then a whole bunch of other kind of regulatory arrangements that ensure that consumers are not cheated by the firm and therefore can trust the, uh, the firm. Product standards, safety, uh, consumer products and consumer safety regulations. Okay? So in many ways, these are the kind of, of standard institutional arrangements that are critical uh, to ensure the productivity of economic activity in a society. And these, are, these, these institutions are fundamentally uh, what I meant when I said at the outset that markets are embedded uh, in, in institutions. But also the second point that there is no single blueprint that, that these regulatory arrangements, these institutions can be provided in a number of very different kinds of ways and different nations, even among sort of Western advanced market economies, they provide very different kinds of these institutions. The United States is very much an equity market based kind of a financial system. Uh, in Germany, bank lending, credit uh, is much more important than, than equity markets. Labor markets obviously are all organized very differently uh, in different countries. Uh, legal systems re uh, differ. Uh, public investment regimes are very different. Um, the United States is very weak there. Uh, the Germ German system has a long-term national development bank that undertakes public investment. So all of these things can be uh, organized in a number of different ways. But going even beyond that, I think what we are really interested in in this course is going beyond these standard set of institutions. Um, and a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about here are, uh, are, are institutional arrangements that go beyond these standard ones. So we're interested in understanding uh, new forms of labor market development, new forms of investment and training and skilling up of the labor force that go simply beyond uh, what uh, exists currently. Uh, if firms are in fact are going to be um, broadly disseminating, uh, the advanced, most productive firms are going to be disseminating their know-how and technology to the rest of society. And what kind of room is there for new forms of property and contract law, as, as Professor Unger um, has stated? Uh, to encourage inter-firm collaboration um, to ensure that there are sort of these mutual investments in new, uh, uh, new innovations. Uh, how can we reform the financial system beyond simply uh, providing greater stability and avoiding systemic crises, but to actually make finance much more uh, serve the needs of a, the real economy of productive investment? Uh, than it does uh, currently.
uh, what uh, new types of industrial policy are going to be required uh, that have the public sector and public sector agencies at different levels of the government uh, engage in strategic collaboration uh, with firms um, with the purpose of, of um, uh, extending their ties into their suppliers, their local communities, and their local workforces. And finally, what does all of that imply uh, for how we would think about what kind of globalization we construct uh, to ensure that these institutional arrangements uh, uh, both have, a, have, have, have a ground on which they can grow um, and ultimately can feed uh, onto a, a, a healthier uh, kind of, of, uh, of globalization. So these are all sort of open questions that, that we want to uh, probe deeper. But I wanted to locate these questions uh, in the context of uh, the more fundamental issues that, uh, uh, that or, or the, the, the kind of fundamental issues that, that uh, um, uh, the typical treatment of institutions uh, sort of stops at. So let me, let me just. Um, so, so we're not going to have to be discussion principles. <coughs> Uh, we, why don't we just um, why don't we do it in a kind of more interactive way, if you will? Let me just um, uh, turn it over, turn it over to you, and then let's just make sure you turn on the the, the volume. <coughs> so my original thought is that uh, I would, in the second part of the class. Uh, address the dilemma of development signaled in the first class. Uh, conventional industrialization no longer offers a reliable path to economic growth, but the alternative, which would be a socially inclusive form of the knowledge economy, radicalized and widely disseminated, seems inaccessible. Uh, how can we make the inaccessible accessible? Uh, but it is uh, important to uh, engage the issues raised by the trilemma that Danny Roderick has, has presented. Uh, and then to go on to the second part of the discussion about the supposedly universal principles in economic uh, thinking and the design of economic institutions. Uh, could we put the trilemma on the board? Good, thank you. So what I have to say is in some ways a criticism and in other ways a reinterpretation and development of Danny Broderick's trilemma. And I want to make three sets of remarks. The first set of remarks is about the top angle of the trilemma, hyperglobalization. The second set of remarks is about national sovereignty and mass politics. And the third set of remarks is about the situation that results from the analysis that I propose. There is a crucial ambiguity in the conception of hyperglobalization. Uh, if we understand hyperglobalization as not simply an unreal limit state, the existence of a world state with no national boundaries, but as a direction. And it is only if we understand it as a tendency or a direction that it is of immediate consequence to us in revealing the tensions and alternatives before us. One idea of hyperglobalization is hyperglobalization means enforced institutional convergence. 
the world economy develops on the basis of convergence to the same institutions. And the situation that Roderick described is simply the ideal limit of this, of this tendency. Uh, this direction of enforced convergence would have to take place on the basis of what I propose to call institutional maximalism. The rules of the world economy, and in particular the rules of world trade, would incorporate as a condition of participation in the global regime, and in specifically in the global commercial regime, not just adherence to the market economy in the abstract, but adherence to a very particular version of the market economy. For example, it, would, it might be a form of the market economy that prohibits, under the label subsidies, all the forms of strategic coordination between governments and firms that the countries that are now rich use to become rich. Or it might be a form of the market economy that incorporated into the rules of the global order and of world trade the entire intellectual property regime uh, the patent and copyright regime developed relatively late at the end of the 19th century. And that has the consequence of leaving many of the technological innovations of greatest importance to humanity in the hands, in the control of a small number of multinational private firms. Now, that is in practice what hyperglobalization in fact means. But there would be another conception of hyperglobalization. And uh, this conception would be the maximization of flows, flows of everything, of goods and services, of capital, and of people, little by little, step by step, on the basis of the opposite of institutional maximalism, institutional minimalism. The principle would be the greatest possible openness in the world economy, the greatest possible communion achieved not instantaneously but over time, with the least possible restraint on the institutional experiments that the member states can perform in the organization of their own economies and societies. Now, this is not just a theoretical contrast. It is a contrast that describes a real divergence in history. For example, we have only to compare two regimes of recent decades. On the one hand, there is the regime of the WTO treaties, which follow the same direction as the recent multilateral trade pacts, the Trans-Pacific Pact, the Transatlantic Pact, all of them in the direction of this institutional maximalism, enforced convergence, an openness, communion only on the basis of enforced convergence. But of course there was an alternative, a relatively recent alternative of the regime of the GATT, which preceded the WTO and which subscribed to the logic of institutional minimalism. Now this regime of the GATT was only the most recent twist on a very old history a very old history of success in the pursuit of institutional minimalism. So a major example of this in the history of trade and of law is the role played in the West by the law merchant, 
that developed over centuries uh, from, the, from the late Middle Ages on. The law merchant was a body of commercial rules, doctrines, and practices that attempted to organize trade and exchange more generally among underlying jurisdictions that had radically different rules and institutions. And it demonstrated by its success that it was possible, that it is possible, to go very far in organizing union on the basis of underlying divergence. Now, it seems clear that in the debates today, what is connoted by hyperglobalization is the first kind of globalization, the enforced convergence on the basis of institutional maximalism. And its predominance in thinking and in policy is the consequence not just of powerful interests, the interests of uh, economic and political elites in the contemporary societies, it is also the expression of the power of certain ideas, bad ideas. Uh, and uh, three sets of bad ideas. So the first set of bad ideas vastly exaggerates the significance of transaction costs, or these risks of arbitrage, as Roderick described them, and underestimates the potential of legal ingenuity to reconcile connection, trade, communion with underlying institutional and doctrinal diversity. The second set of bad ideas understates the significance of diversity itself, not just its political and cultural value, but its economic value. After all, the fecundity of a method of competitive selection depends on the richness of the material on which the method of competitive selection operates. And here is a remarkable fact about the main line of economic theory as it evolved from the time of the marginalists on. From the standpoint of this main line of economic theory, the division of humanity into sovereign states with distinct rules and institutions either has no proper economic significance or is a costly embarrassment because, for example, it generates transaction costs and problems of arbitrage. Uh, the world might just as well be a single state. But of course, this idea, even on the narrowest economic grounds, makes no sense given the fundamental point made before, that the value of the method of competitive selection is parasitic on the richness of the material on which it operates. So what we have in this body of ideas is something like half of the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the life sciences. We have the half about a, a competitive selection, but not the half about genetic mutation and recombination. Where's the other half? The other half is missing. And without knowing what the other half is, we can't know what the value of the first half is. Now comes the third bad idea. And the third bad idea may be the worst of all. <laughs> the third bad idea is that uh, the market economy has a single natural and necessary form, and it gradually evolves to a determinate content. 
underlying the idea of enforced convergence. 150 years of legal analysis have demonstrated the opposite, that the market economy has no natural form. There is no natural regime of property or contract, and no natural way to organize economic decentralization. Uh, now, what is it that in practice would resist the influence, the power of the maximalist thesis, hyper-globalization as enforced convergence on the basis of institutional maximalism? How could the other direction come again to prevail? It certainly could not be as the gift of an enlightened cosmopolitan elite. Because for the most part, this cosmopolitan elite is entangled in the interest and preconceptions of this, of this world that supports the project of, of convergence and institutional maximalism. It could happen only if there were strong national projects underneath, hitting against the limits imposed by the convergent hyperglobalization. That's how it could happen. And then these strong states, in conjunction with one another, would force a change. That's how it would happen. Now, then I come to the second set of remarks. Uh, about national sovereignty and mass politics. So what about national sovereignty? There, too, we have to make a distinction. National sovereignty with strong national projects and national sovereignty without strong national projects. So what I mean by a strong national project is a project that involves the large-scale mobilization of resources, human, financial, economic, physical resources, characteristically orchestrated by the state, as the basis for the creation of a distinct strategy and set of institutions and a set of institutions that broadly widens the, uh, the capacity of economic agency of a large mass of its citizens. A corollary is the rise in the productivity of labor. Now, the project of creating a, an inclusive knowledge economy is simply a subset, a variant of that family of strong national projects. So, for example, if Britain or Greece leave the European Union, but they don't leave it in order to do something, to become something, but just continue to muddle along as they were before, when they were relying on their membership in the European Union as an excuse not to become something different, uh, then we don't have a strong national project. We have, we have state sovereignty without a strong national project. The enemy of strong national projects is what you could call the path of least resistance. There's an innovation in the world, a set of organizational and technological innovations like the knowledge economy. And the path of least resistance consists in developing and implementing this innovation in the way that least disturbs the dominant interests and the predominant preconceptions. That's the path of least resistance. And the confined knowledge economy that exists, insular, restricted to fringes, is a characteristic product of the path of least resistance. So the path of least resistance associated with the renunciation of strong national projects 
help sustain the hyper-globalization as convergence on the basis of institutional maximalism. Now, you could ask, does the United States, the senior superpower, have a strong national project? It used to. So, especially in the first half of the 19th century. There was a Hamiltonian project a forced mobilization of resources to build a country. And it was combined with a radical institutional innovation in the particular sectors that were then crucial to the American economy, agriculture and finance. That was the project. And it has become progressively weaker in subsequent moments of American history. It had a resurgence, a dramatic resurgence, under the conditions of the Second World War. The war economy, when in four years, GDP in the United States doubled on the basis of the combination of forced mobilization of resources with radical institutional innovation. The economy was run on completely different principles from the principles that prevailed in peacetime. Now, what about the junior superpower, China? Does it have a strong national project? Well, it had a whole host of institutional innovations in the way of organizing decentralized economic activity and relating private or social activity to the state. But the potential of these innovations to serve as the raw material of a strong national project has been greatly reduced under the double incubus of political authoritarianism and mental colonialism. So the interest in maintaining control prevails against the experimentalist potential. And in the Central Party School in Beijing, or the technical apparatus of the State Council, they are not discussing the doctrines that could sustain a strong, rebellious national project. They are debating the theories of Western academics that demonstrate why the world has to be more or less the way it is now. Uh, so there would have to be both a political resistance and an intellectual overthrow for this situation to change. Now, uh, strong national projects, the strong form of the exercise of state sovereignty, of national sovereignty, are in turn connected to the deepening of democracy. There isn't any simple one-to-one -one relation. But also with respect to mass politics, and in particular democratic mass politics, we can distinguish a weak form and a strong form. The strong form of democratic mass politics raises the temperature of political life the level of organized popular engagement in politics, hastens the pace through the rapid resolution of impasse, and creates a system fertile in the production of models and counter models. So there's a direction, and then parts of the country can secede and experiment with alternatives. And the test, or one of the tests, is the ability of the state sustained by this deepened democracy to resist capture by the interests of narrow elites. Now, that is by contrast to weak democracy and to an authoritarian regime that allows a vanguard to speak in the name of the nation 
without the deepening of mass politics. And that's what we have in the world. We have a collection of weak democracies juxtaposed to authoritarian regimes. We don't have strong democracy. We don't have the deepening of mass politics. Now I come to the third part of my remarks. What then is the situation? that results from this analysis in the trilemma. You can distinguish two states of affairs. In one state of affairs, which is what actually prevails today, you have the movement toward hyperglobalization in the first sense. Convergence on the basis of institutional maximalism. And its fundamental preconditions are, first, uh, the weak af affirmation of national sovereignty, sovereignty without strong national projects, and second, the diminishment of democratic politics, the prevalence of weak democracies and authoritarian regimes. The hyperglobalization as convergence and maximalism is simply an expression of this underlying reality. Now suppose the second state of affairs of the trilemma, the state that doesn't exist. There we imagine the proliferation of strong national projects and a context to deepen democracy mass politics, and the expression of this marriage of strong national projects to the deepening of democratic mass politics is the alternative form of globalization. And that's the other world. That's the other state of affairs. That's what's at stake. And uh, one complaint against the way in which Danny represents his trilemma is that it doesn't clearly reveal that fundamental difference of direction. Because to my mind, it fails to make the necessary analytical distinctions with respect to each of the elements of the trilemma. Now, what are the more general lessons to take away from this discussion? So the first lesson is that the debate about national alternatives and the debate about global alternatives are simply the reverse sides of each other. They're not really different debates. They're different sides of the same debate. But in that debate, the issue of national alternatives has primacy over the issue of global alternatives. The real force comes from below, from the nation states, and from their projects, or from their failure to have projects. Uh, and that's what most fundamentally explains the situation at the global level, the direction taken to globalization. The second lesson is that Neither the market economy nor globalization are there on a taken or leave it basis. So the real debate is never more market, less market, more globalization, less globalization. But which market and which globalization? So 250 years of ideological controversy have been built on this premise that the axis of the ideological context is more market, less government, more government, less market, synthesis of market and government. The real issue is what is the form, what is the content of both the market and democracy? Which market, which democracy? That's the real debate. And the same goes for globalization. Which globalization? Which of these two that I've described here? The third lesson to infer from this discussion is that 
The beginning of understanding is always the development of insight into the alternatives. To understand the phenomenon is always to grasp what it can become under certain provocations or conditions. If we don't understand what we can, it can become, we're not explaining it. We're just staring at it. And all of our accounts have the character of a retrospective rationalization. When the vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible is severed, as it is in the contemporary social sciences, including economics, discovery gives way to mystification. I think disappointingly, I think there, there's more that we agree on that, sure. than, than we, we, uh, we disagree. But I think the way you put um, many of these things is, is, is quite, um, um, quite useful and uh, I think highlights a number of, of, of issues. Um, I mean, I'm just going to say just a, a couple of, of things without necessarily you know, trying to respond to anything in particular because I do want for people to um, to come into the discussion yes. and, and uh, you, know, you might want to prompt us into some disagreements here but I, let me just highlight a couple of things where I think it might be useful to maybe in the next round go a little bit deeper into um, so we agree we agree that there are different types of, of globalization um, and um, and that what I described here as, as hyper globalization uh, is a particular form that, uh, as you say, um, uh, proceeds on the assumption of institutional maximalism uh, that is forces a kind of institutional convergence um, and effectively prioritizes uh, the elimination or the reduction of what I call transactions costs with everything else becoming secondary. Um, that is a trade-off that I wanted to highlight that I don't think can ultimately evade, but I think it's secondary to our discussion, which is that if there is something going, if there's something in favor of hyper-globalization, and if there is a reason why it's something that always remains on the agenda of economists, uh, is that it is in fact the one, because it eliminates or reduces the transactions cost, has the prospect of making the scope of division of labor the broadest possible. Um, now, it is of course possible that in some future world, um, you know that that you're, you know, reducing the possibilities of further development because you know that might subsume the possibility or might prevent the possibility of strong national projects, might you know uh, circumscribe the, the the terms of productive development, innovation, and so forth. That's entirely possible, uh, but. Uh, you know, holding that aside, um, there is uh, this issue to make it very concrete, for example. If Britain was to, as you say quite rightly, and I agree with you, that, that the reason for leaving the EU, if you want to leave the EU, is that you have a strong national project. There is something you want to do that the EU doesn't allow you to do. And that's an, that would be an argument. And Britain has not yet demonstrated that it has such a project. Um, but if it did have such a project and it left the EU, uh, the trade-off is that it would actually uh, incur certain economic costs uh, that arise from the fact that its banks cannot, not, cannot anymore freely operate in the rest of the um, uh, European Union. There are all these you know, new product and, and uh, um, regulatory um, uh, barriers that are going to be imposed both on the imports of European goods into Britain and exports of Britain to, into the European Union, uh, that mobili mobility of labor is going to be restricted and therefore skilled professionals will have much harder time uh, moving around. Uh, I'm not saying to, to make a big deal out of these costs, but there are certain costs that uh, certainly at the short to medium run uh, 
uh, a Brexit strategy, even in the service of a strong national project, would, would incur. And that's precisely why you would want to have a national, strong national project to incur those costs, uh, because otherwise, you know, if you're not going to be using your, your freedom uh, to any, any particular you know, good purpose, why simply impose those costs in the first place? So, but, but having said, so one, one issue that, that we might you know, want to get into and in fact use as a bridge to our next set of discussions would be what a strong national project for a country like Britain outside the European Union might look like. Um, um, so that's a, a, an issue potentially for, for, for us um, uh, to, dis to discuss. Um, so, um, so I, I, I largely um, agree with um, um, so one question for you is um, even though I'm, I'm in agreement I think it might be useful for, for us to have a discussion for the class to raise questions about you said that the, 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 the animation has to come always from a strong national project that, that um, uh, there are, and, and that would be one alternative form of globalization, and one that I also that I favor with, which is to say, sort of, you want a, a sort of a, a globalization, a sort of global rules uh, that enable these national projects to develop. And uh, what you get in terms of the, re the desirable globalization is really the sum total of these national projects, rather than try to enforce what nations can do under a, a scenario of, of institutional maximalism. But it's not the only alternative, right? So we've this, now we've described two different forms of globalization. One, the hyper-globalization model of institutional maximalism. Second, in which we, we're boringly you know, in disagreement, which is a kind of a, a, a globalization that is the end result of uh, national projects. Um, but there are other models of globalization on the table as well. One that doesn't rely on strong national projects, in fact, says that the nation, you know, the nation state is no longer that relevant. And, and it's really the, a, what we need to, 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 to do is think about how we can get more global governance, global coordination, global cooperation through multilateral institutions, uh, an OECD, a reformed WTO, uh, a kind of a World Bank, an IMF, and global corporations, after all, they're global and they have, that's where the management and technology and know-how are situated. Um, you know, sort of, they can be the transnational forces. Uh, and instead of trying to develop these uh, institutional arrangements on the basis of the nation state or the, at the national level, you can imagine a kind of all kind of different ways of, of jurisdictional overlaps, but putting the emphasis on the transnational much more than, than the national. So that would be a kind of a, you know, uh, it would not necessarily be a model of institutional maximalism if you imbue that transnational effort with the spirit uh, that, um, that there's basically a, the principle of subsidiarity, that you have some general rules at the global level, but you provide still a lot of room for, um, uh, for uh, experimentation uh, locally, but the animating force becomes much more the global cooperation rather than sort of these uh, you know, strong. And one final thing, um, what a lot of people worry about uh, when people talk about strong national projects is that strong national projects, you know, you can get, um, you know, Caesarism as much as you can get a kind of inclusive uh, prosperity agenda. Um, and the question would be whether, in fact, um, uh, what are the sort of the, the, the various risks and trade-offs uh, in, in environment. <coughs> but, let, let's see if there are, there are you know, before you um, come in on that, let's see if there's uh, some people want to just come. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if in this, uh, in this force convergence also other areas of development are play, play, play a role, like for instance, international human rights law, specifically in the, in the case of uh, international tribunals and the universal system where there is this also institutional like uh, this idea of, of creating these pools and universal values where, where all these countries will converge. There's also like a force convergence, <coughs> and also on the area of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. 
where there's, there's been like a lot of participation from the global south and civil society to, uh, to, uh, to, to get to these goals. So do you also think that there's like forced convergence in these areas? I think it's a different problem. So uh, <clears throat> that, by the way, would be a kind of a specific illustrations of what I said, like the third model of globalization in, in some ways. Yeah. So, but I wouldn't think of it as a third model. Let me illustrate what I mean. Instead of speaking theoretically, let me illustrate my remark about Europe, about the European Union, which makes, which makes clear. The European Union, for the most part, has developed uh, according to the principle that the rules governing the forms of economic organization are increasingly centralized. Der Jure in Brussels and de facto in Berlin. And the prerogative to define the social and educational endowments of the citizens, their rights, their basic rights and their equipment, is delegated to the national and subnational authorities. If you think along the lines suggested by my analysis, your view must be that this construction should be turned upside down, that the prerogative of the union the first responsibility is to ensure the capabilities of all of its citizens, their endowment, their equipment, but then to create in the European space the widest possible latitude for institutional experimentation in the forms of a free society. So uh, on this view, it's really an interpretation of the idea of, of of rights, of fundamental rights. Uh, if I could compare it metaphorically uh, in this way. The parent says to the child, I love you unconditionally. You have, through my love, an unconditional place in the world. Now go out and raise a storm. So in a more complete argument of fundamental rights and endowments, there have to be the two parts. The part about the haven of vital security and equipment and the part about the storm. In the conventional discourse, the second part is always missing. Where's the part about the storm? Where's the, where's the opening up? Where's, where's the radical experimentation? But there's no contradiction between one and the other because uh, this ability to generate alternatives presupposes an empowered agent. And there have to be then a set of arrangements that establish the empowerment. I, I thought your question was somewhat different. And I mean, to tell you how I understood your question, which was that. Um, well, it's whether I understood is whether there was a tension between the idea of establishing these universal rights yeah. and the minimalism. And, and, and the counter argument that I'm making is that there's no true tension because this radicalization of difference for it to be fertile depends on the, on, on the endowment, on the equipment, on the enhancement of agency. So something has to be taken out of the agenda of short-term politics for the agenda of short-term politics to widen. That's the, the, the apparent paradox that is illustrated by the metaphor of the parent and the child. So, so my, my version of the story was whether, or the question was whether, to put it very starkly, are there, might there be some global norms uh, that actually uh, uh, escape the criticism uh, of uh, you know, institutional maximalism? In other words, for example, you mentioned yeah. human rights. So is there sort of, is there, are there some global human rights norms that are truly global 
and which don't give an individual nation the right to say, Absolutely. oh, but I, 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 I understand global <coughs> norms I and in, human rights and implement them very differently. Of course. So, you know, of so course. human rights, for example, might be very different than, let's say, financial regulation, yes. where you might say international regulation, there's no really good reason to believe that we have one ideal way of what fin regulatory systems look like. Whereas in human rights, you might say, well, you know, human rights is human rights is human rights. So I think the, the example that may be most interesting, because it's most proximate to economic life, is the status of labor. So you say, we're going to organize this world economy, this open world economy, on the basis of free labor. Now, free labor is compatible with differences in the returns to labor in the value of the real wage. But it, it, it has a content. So we're not thinking of an unqualified pluralism. We're thinking of a qualified pluralism in this project. I, I was focusing only on the economic aspect. And the qualified pluralism might be very aggressive. Uh, it, it, it might not be minimalist at all. So for example, uh, there are three types of free labor economically dependent wage labor, self-employment, and cooperation. In the 19th century, the liberals and socialists alike all thought that wage labor was an inferior and transitory form of free labor. And it, it is inferior. They believe that it had many of the characteristics of serfdom and slavery. So we might have reason not just to insist on free labor in a minimalist sense, but to create in the world system a, a bias in the direction of the overcoming of wage labor as the predominant form of free labor. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not simply an idea of agnosticism, of passivity. Uh, it's a shape of experimentation in the forms of free economic life. And so this discussion we had about the trilemma, we have to expand. Okay. Take some more uh, questions. Yeah. Um, so my question is, in terms of designing or uh, creating a strong national project that endows people with the sort of economic agency and self-realization that's necessary to create this type of experimentation, what are the sort of characteristics or requirements of a strong national project to achieve that? Well, then it becomes a long programmatic discussion. We have to get into the details. And I wanted to have just a sketch, a, a, a minimal definition of a strong national project in which the two crucial elements are mobilization of resources and then the broadening of economic capability, the enhancement of economic agency, which has as its byproduct labor productivity. That forms a strong national project. How can you have a strong national project if the majority of people are excluded from the most advanced practices of production? That's the discussion presented by the knowledge economy in its confined form. But besides, in the next few weeks, we're going to be getting into the elements of uh, so next, you know, so sort of the week after when we talk about sort of you know the growth models when we go into the sort of new economy and industrial policies, financial markets, labor markets, and institutions. These are sort of various uh, slices of that that we're going to be getting into so that hopefully by the end of the course, you if not a complete, uh, at least you know, certain uh, significant elements of that we should understand. Yeah, just responding to something you said, Gary, there's, there's a whole part of this discussion which didn't feature either in what you said or what I said. So uh, the, 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 uh, a, a characteristic, a corollary of the first type of hyperglobalization, institutional convergence and institutional maximalism, is the radically differential treatment of the movement of things and of capital and the movement of people. So, in, in, in effect, people, uh, things, and money 
should be as free to move as possible, but people should be imprisoned within the nation state or in blocks of relatively homogeneous nation states, such as the European Union. Uh, now, we didn't ask this, this question, I didn't ask the question, comparing the two forms of globalization, there's still the issue of which of them generates over time the greatest flow among states. The basic definition of globalization as flow. And the argument I would make is that the first kind of globalization narrowly focused on the movement of some factors and not of others, uh, turns all of, the, uh, all of the enemies of these forms of dispossession and imposition into enemies of globalization. And then we have what you call the populist backlash against globalization. So it's a forced march to institutional convergence, which is then interrupted by the popular reaction. The alternative uh, would have to present us with a picture of a, a slower movement in the direction of greater flow, in which things, money, and people gain freedom together in small cumulative steps. And in each domain, there would be specific problems. So uh, freedom of goods and services has to be reconciled with industrial strategies. Uh, freedom <coughs> of capital has to be reconciled with the ability of these national states and their strong projects not to suffer the vetoes of international finance through a capital strike. And Freedom of movement is only feasible if it grows very slowly, with compensations to the countries that send people and with safeguards for the countries that receive them. But, you would say, this would be a slower process, but one which over time would produce a much deeper and more reliable basis for the development of an open world economy. And then populism, if you ask about Caesarism. So how are we to understand it in the terms of this framework? So it's like a crude, perverted, truncated form of the association of mass politics with strong state projects. So it's a reaction, but it's a reaction which is not just dangerous, but relatively empty. It has no constitutional project, except the strengthening of executive authority. What is its project in political economy? It's a purely defensive project. A few more years for declining mass production. Barriers to, to, to immigration, which overlaps considerably with the project of the traditional social democrats. So one of the, I mean, maybe if I can follow up a little bit on that. Um, I would maybe say just one thing about globalization because it might be important. Um, I think one difference in the way that we use globalization, particularly how we measure it, has some relevance to the, to, to the discussion that we're having, which is not quite really productive. So let me get it out of uh, out. So um, uh, you measure globalization by the flow. And I'm resisting that because I think the economically relevant measure of globalization is the height of the barrier. Um, so those are conceptually two different things. I think from an economic standpoint, what measures is the barrier and not the volume of flows. So you can <coughs> imagine countries you know, that, where there's actually very little flow uh, because countries are very similar, so there's no reason for flows, but there aren't that much barriers. Uh, so I think you know, the reason I put emphasis on, on, on transaction costs is because I think it's the relevant measure of globalization is the height of the barrier and not necessarily the flow. So, and then I think that partly, I think, is, is, is then helps us square the two part of you know, what you and I said. So in the GATT system, we have very rapidly expanding flows. 
of trade and foreign investment, even though the barriers were relatively high. I think that goes to your point that you can actually have a system where uh, there is a fair amount of you know, uh, sand in the wheels of trade and finance. So it's not as globalized by the economically relevant sense. But because the constituent units are relatively healthy, in one way or another, they're following national programs. Uh, um, you know, the globalization that results from that, from measured by the flow of goods and capital, still seems to be fairly vibrant and fairly healthy. Yeah. Uh, so I think you know that's the way to square the two regimes. That that is that that uh, and, and and why I was emphasizing the, the barriers. But on, on Caesarism, I think one pushback, and I think this was very obvious in some of the papers I read. Uh, there were the response papers from the Kennedy School students uh, for this week, which is to say, well, all this stuff about you know institutional diversity and experimentation, you know, sounds good. But I come from a country where which had tremendous amount of institutional experimentation. And most of it really went terribly. Uh, so, you know, just tell me why I should feel good about institutional experimentation <laughs> um, and, 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 and as about, you know, sort of, you know, this is a, really a name for Caesarism or populism or, you know, all kinds of doing crazy things that, uh, that, that violate our first order principles. So maybe, you know, 10 years after the fact, maybe it's easier to turn back and say, yeah, this was a bad kind of experimentation. Uh, but how do we say, how do we tell this in real time? And uh, so this is a, this so is. I think we need to have <coughs> we need to have the other discussion that we didn't have today yeah. about your universal principle. Yes, because that's the occasion yes. on which to speak about yes. what the what experimentation well, I have means. Some extended principles, which I call these economic principles. Yeah. And I, you don't, and so you don't like them. You say there are, you know, they're either you know not, non-existent or trivial. Yes, correct. So, you know, so, <laughs> so, but then your answer is that so you know you would ask me as an economist whether this you know. So we're they, we're pointing to a discussion which we haven't had. So <laughs> I think something not, this not not now. So we have to say a little bit about this about this discussion. So there are what, what time is it? We have 15, almost 12 minutes. Okay. So we can so, start on A little bit. So uh, think of economics with, with respect to institutions. So at one pole of the spectrum is pure economic analysis, entirely empty of any institutional commitments or presuppositions. Uh, at the opposite pole of the spectrum is what you could call fundamentalist economics, which reifies a particular version of the market economy. It says the market economy has to look like this, like 19th century private law in Germany. Uh, and so this debate that we're speaking about universal principles is an example of an attempt to find a middle position between pure economics and fundamentalist economics uh, with respect to institutions. So the idea is there isn't one institutional form of the market, but there is a set of universally applicable economic principles which guide you as a principle of selection in institutional design. There, there are many other ways to try and find an intermediate position. In this debate, I hold against Danny that these intermediate universal principles are, are, are all bogus. They don't, they, if you look at them closely, they're not, they're, they're not, they are not in fact and do not deserve to be universal unless you thin out their definition to such a point that they become empty. And now, the, 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 to, to my mind, the danger of the apparatus is, so it, it suggests a view that there is a, a, a codification of sound economic thinking with institutional consequences. And then there are a lot of local experiments around the world as opposed to 
uh, a contrast of structural views. And I, I think we need a different way of dealing with institutions in which the subject of structures and alternative structures becomes the central topic. And then we can think that it's not just a universal orthodoxy against a collection of local heresies, but that there can be a contrast, a conflict of universalizing heresies. You see, by, by disagreeing with you, you're leaving yourself completely uh, undefended uh, <laughs> you know, against this objection that you have no way of discriminating beforehand. Uh, as to whether an experimentation is a valuable yeah. or one, uh, that, correct. Um, so I have, I have, I have some. I mean, I have some mechanism because I see when I see a Chavez or a Maduro, um, and when you know, gold prices, gold prices of oil are at their very height, and they're spending all of it on uh, various social programs. I can put my economist hat and say, you know, this is going to end in tears. Yes. Um, and uh, because I can do the intertemporal consumption smoothing, I can apply my universal principle of you know, fiscal sustainability, um, and you know, you know, that tells me that this is not so, the kind of experimentation I'm interested correct. in. Correct. So what, um, and, and that's just an example. So, uh, so, in, so in the programmatic parts of, of our discussion, my position is not that strong national projects and experimentation are good per se. For me, this category which I use there in the discussion is the dilemma of strong national projects is normatively neutral. There's a subset of strong national projects which we might have reason to develop and to support, and then we can begin to list their characteristics. So uh, the, the, one of the most fundamental characteristics is that they enhance agency broadly, not just economic agency, but political and moral agency. Uh, for example, to t go back to the discussion of the knowledge economy, they open the gateways of access to the most advanced practice of production, which is something that lies at the intersection between economic agency and these other forms of agency. The idea of experimentation is not meant to be a black box, an empty idea, in which somehow experimentation is good in itself. No, that, that's not the idea. And if, if we present to ourselves the project of uh, organizing a democracy that is capable of mastering the structure of society and of discovering new paths. Given our points of departure, there will be a very particular content for which I will argue. It's not just an invention to do anything. Okay, no, that's good. But I mean, I, I think, you know, again, if I were to criticize, criticize you, I would say that your criteria are either not operational. Uh, for example, the one that you just used, which is enhancing agency, because after all, you know, Chavez was interested in increasing the agency of, of the poor, and, and that was the claim, and there's some version of what he was doing that could have been justified un under that. Or, um, alternatively, as um, you know, some of your, su your specific suggestions, we, have, we haven't talked about it today, but it was in the readings for this week, um, the recommendation that any sort of any strong national program have as one of its elements uh, the significant boosting up of domestic savings. Uh, that strikes me as something that's operational, uh, very concrete, and probably doesn't apply to a whole lot of cases. Um, so it's overly concrete and overly um, uh, prescriptive. So I think that those are, you know, if, if, if my criteria are, you know, either trivial or, or um, uh, or don't exist, I think it was going to be like... But let me speak to that, just so we understand. The, the, so, one of the teachings of Keynesianism was that saving is more a consequence than a cause of economic growth. And there is a special problem in the, in the majority of economies in beginning a strategy 
of rebellious development. So when you begin, the state and the economy need not to be on their knees. And they need to be able, at the beginning of the process, to take initiatives that the capital markets are inclined to veto. That's why it's necessary to have a cushion, a safeguard, a shield. The shield can take the form of foreign reserves or of national savings, but there has to be some shield. And the argument in favor of the shield trumps the traditional considerations in favor of counter cyclical management of the economy. So when we descend to this level, and I agree with you, it has to be contextualized. Uh, we, we, we then have to begin to describe the elements, the preconditions for the formation of these strong projects. One of them is that one. Yeah, I mean, um, I can, you know, for some countries you might be right, again, for other countries that's strong, for example, with an excess of saving or investment like China. There wouldn't be any reason to start with you know increasing saving because it's already very high to begin with. So again, it's, it, that's sort of contextual and therefore it's, it doesn't seem to be the same universal standing. You're taking this out of the historical sequence to time out, but China at the start of its process of rebellion had to mobilize resources and create the shield. It's not in the situation that I just described okay. of initiating. We might have time for one more comment or question. Yeah. This is me. Yeah. Uh, would you say a project like Trump's America could it be converted to a national project if right now it's like a vacuous or Caesarist project? Converted? What do you mean? Like uh, you said, a phenomenon could be something else, right? So there is a project now. Could it go somewhere productive? Well, anything can change. Steps, right? Uh, anything can change into the next thing. But in 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 general, uh, this so-called right wing populism exists because the institutionally conservative social democrats have had no response to the structural problems of their society. There's a hierarchical segmentation of the economy, and they don't propose anything about it. And it, it's it, one of its immediate effects is the dispossession of the working class majority. Right wing populism steps into this vacuum. But it steps into this vacuum without having a strongly defined project of its own. It's a kind of liquefaction of the structure. So uh, the substitution of uh, organized politics by a personalist extra or anti institutional politics, and the use of a series of reallocation of rights and resources to provide immediate solace to a constituency <coughs> or to its resentments without creating a real, a real strategy of an alternative. It has no structural content, in which respect it's very similar to the project of the conservative social democrats. So that's a huge opportunity for the progressive if they had a program, but they don't. Would you say that textualism or like isolationism is some sort of content? Okay, hold on to that question. Okay. We're going to come back to it. Uh, next, we will be joined by Professor Daron Ajemolo from uh, MIT, and we will use that as an occasion to deepen our discussions in two directions both <coughs> markets, institutions, and experimentalism and the new economy and the, the, the development of that. See you next week.